three, two, one. Welcome to the SaaS Pulse Show. My name is Michael Bertoni, and I'm the founder and CEO of SaaS Talent. And I am so excited today. I have an amazing guest who's really on the cutting edge of financial and economic data, Stefan Rust. He is the founder of Truflation, which he told me in the pregame is the source of truth for financial and economic data. So it's great to have you on the show, Stefan. It's great to have you here. No, thank you for having me and, and love what you're doing. I really think it's really important to open the eyes for everybody in terms of where the opportunity is and, and, and sort of highlight this is actually, despite all the things, the doom and gloom on the left and on the right, you know, we're in front of us is the most exciting time to be alive, in my view. There are so many opportunities. We just need to grasp them and we need to educate and we need platforms like yours and what you're doing to help provide insights and how to on-ramp and educate ourselves on what's going on. So thank you for having me. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you. We all have the opportunity to manifest our destiny. And I mean, it's it's an amazing time. I mean, there's so much can be done. You just, you just got to think it, believe it, and you can do it. But let's get into it here, Stefan. So everybody has a superhero backstory, right? So I love the superhero backstory. So can you share your background and journey that led you to where you are today? Look, I've had a very interesting background. I've been very fortunate. I've grown up in, in all continents. I've lived on all continents around the world. I was born in a place called Hong Kong, um, just off the coast of China, um, and, and ultimately then moved to Switzerland, studied in Switzerland, um, learned German by on that process, but then went felt I need was missing something, you know, and I wanted to learn Mandarin at the time when I graduated. So went to China, studied Mandarin, and then that's where I then met some very interesting people and mobile tele technology was just growing. And so we launched a mobile network. We decided to launch that in China, a billion people, 1.3 billion people, everybody's gonna have a phone. This is gonna be the biggest market in the world and pursued that dream. And we actually were very lucky and fortunate. I had a very close name, my brother sort of, um, who had managed to secure the rights for four city mobile networks in four cities across China. And bear in mind, these cities have 10 plus million people living in these cities. So they're ginormous. Um, and so how do we launch that? We launched that very luckily, sold it to China Unicom. But then I wanted to get out of China. I think I'd had enough. I'd experienced enough. It was wild enough and it evolved enough. And I met Sun Microsystems launching this Java virtual machine for on the mobile phone, which allowed people to build applications on mobile phones. Wow! And that's sort of where I started building out my experience in developer acquisition, taking developers thought process and feedback in terms of seeing where markets will be moving towards. So what I call developer led innovation. So the developers will lead it and then identifying how those can be possibly commercialized. And that's sort of really where I hone my skills. Um, 2007 came along, the iPhone evolved, and the iPhone was ultimately the platform where everybody was going to build mobile apps and be able to interact with a screen um, that we were all looking to build and wanted to see outside of the class of mobile operators or mobile handset manufacturers. So it was really a brilliant new entree into the market. Um, and so I then pursued my path and my strength, left Sun and launched my own developer agency where we would help all the competitors to Apple build out app stores and other developer uh, activities. And so that's what we did. 2012 came along and developer wanted to get paid in Bitcoin. What the hell is Bitcoin? Wow. Right? And yeah, so Bitcoin. Looked up Bitcoin in 2012 and then just sort of didn't think much about it, just bought some. It was clunky it was really hard to use download keywords had to know an ebay merchant that would sell it to me pay by credit card using my paypal uh, so using my credit card so all of these things and it was like such a unsure time but when i came around a year later to actually pay that developer number one the bitcoin price when i bought it was at five dollars all of a sudden it was like nearly four hundred dollars like some three hundred eighty dollars or something so it was like 
wow, yeah, this is economical. You know, I can pay him, save me money because I was going to pay him the US dollar equivalent and pay that in Bitcoin. And it was no fees instantaneously on a peer to peer basis. And that's really what got me excited. Um, and I thought that I then became CEO of Bitcoin.com. Was We were based in Japan. So I lived in Japan for a bit, uh, running that. Um, yeah. And then we moved to Hong Kong to launch Proofflation because what had happened once we'd grown to 20 million uh, wallets on phones and focusing only on phones and bringing self custodial wallets to phones. We also had acquired some 500,000 merchants, but the government at COVID time shut pretty much the global economy down and all these merchants, and we were stuck with, okay, what do we do now? And governments were telling us truflation, you know, inflation is transitory. Don't worry, we got you covered, we'll look after you. But then if you shut the economy, you print a lot of money, any sort of, you know, anybody that sort of has a 101 in economics, which Fortunately, more of us have today and more of us are a lot more conscious of what is inflation and talk about inflation a lot more, which we're happy to be a part of. And I think we I will claim that we had a bit of you know, um, education done in that market and managed to convince people that inflation is a hidden tax. It's debasing and it has an impact on your household spending. You now today spending 25 percent more than you did three, four years ago on your household items. And so that was really what we set out to do. Um, and I left Bitcoin.com and launched Truflation and brought in some good developers to help us build this. And today we have 18 million items that we track every single day across three price feeds per item that we track. And we built this great decentralized technology where we make this available to any developer, we built a dashboard so anybody can see where is inflation across the U.S. market and the United Kingdom as well. So, Stefan, it's amazing your background and world travel. I mean, so this this if you want to learn how to world travel, just reach out to Stefan because I mean he's traveling between Austin and Asia and and China. It's amazing, but. For everybody that doesn't know Trueflation, Stefan, just give it in a nutshell. So what what in a nutshell is Trueflation? What's your unique value proposition? And what are your customers? So who are your customers? Talk about that. So Trueflation is, I mean, you can go to Trueflation.com, T-R-U-flation.com, and you can actually see in real time what is inflation today, tomorrow, what was it yesterday? So you'll be able to see on a daily basis how infl what is inflation. And we believe this is the true inflation. So we've come up with our own methodology that slightly differs from that from the government, which we at the same time feel is a more accurate reflection of what the costs are for average households across the US. How much are you paying at the gas station? What are you paying at the grocery store? How much are your eggs? You know, um, What is your rent? Uh, et cetera. And so we believed how much are you paying for that flight, that hotel, whatever you're doing? Um, how do we aggregate that pricing information? How do we break it down into categories? So we have 12 categories versus the government's six categories. We update it every single day versus updated on a monthly basis. We do not go back and edit the data, whereby the government can go back up to six months and change the data. Um, so we've just really tried to be a source of truth for inflation. Um, why? Because we are all bearing the costs of what it means to buy, you know, not I can't buy six eggs anymore. I can only afford four eggs because inflation and the cost of goods has gone up faster than the costs of this or the salaries that people are earning in. That's amazing. So tell me the business model. I mean, how does that work? So people go to Trueflation. Obviously, they get a lot of great data, right? So they get a lot of great data. You're giving them accurate data. It sounds like you have better tracking, you know, six as opposed to 12. So what? how does the business model work? That's one thing that I was trying to figure out stuff on. So how does that work? How do you make money at Trueflation? How does that work? 
So we're generally, so there's a, a public element that you see on the website. You can go, you can access and get a good overview of what is inflation and, and, and for free, right? So that's basic for free. Um, what we found is that there is a big market out there, $4.4 trillion worth of loans that are tied to, an inf to the inflation. So if we've got $4.4 trillion of loans coupled to inflation, those can be uh, bonds, those can be companies issuing those, those can be governments, uh, and that could be the US government as well issuing those bonds. Ultimately, there is a constituent out there that are looking for leading economic indicators to help them forecast and predict where inflation is going to land. And ultimately, what does that mean for government policies related to interest rates? Interest rates are coupled to the borrowing of money. If interest rates go down, that means money is cheaper. If they're high up, money is more expensive. What happens with bonds, these bonds are tied to maybe 10 years worth of duration. So I'm lending you money for 10 years and you're paying me interest on an annual basis for the money that I'm lending you. Right Now, those have a multiple of impact. How far in the duration am I? Do I have 10 years to go, five years, four years, et cetera? How much is the interest on that loan? And ultimately, what is the cost of that loan? I can sell it today at a discount given the future outlook of the yield I'm going to be getting and the money I'm going to be getting back and the duration of that. So that drives a yield. And a lot of investors have a lot of these funds that they manage. And so they manage the yield very carefully. And so they can offload it when the yield is low and they want to often buy it before it goes up. And so if we nice. can help them predict it will go up, they may want to buy more now while the prices are low so that if prediction goes up, interest rate goes up, people are more excited, they want to buy more bonds, the price of the units go up. And so ultimately, this is the trading that a lot of these investment houses do on a day in and day out basis. And ultimately, they're willing to pay a lot of money for data to help them predict that outcome. And that's sort of where we try to make a lot of our money. We do that in the fiat world. And what we're trying to do in the blockchain world is then ultimately provide this data so that people can also access these products. So in the past, think about it, commodities, this is the second business model, by the way, sorry. The commodities today are tradable by about 10 institutions worldwide, maybe a bit more, but ultimately there are maybe 10 to 15 institutions that are generating a hundred billion dollars in profits trading these commodities from uranium to cacao to orange juice to pork bellies. All of these elements are being traded back and forth as well as obviously the metals that are out there, copper, aluminum, you know, all the assets that go into your electric vehicle should you have an electric vehicle, for example. And so all of those that get traded, how do we make these products available so that anybody anywhere in the world can participate in trading in global assets? And so we've made these prices available to all of these different uh, companies that are building out interesting, innovative new solutions. They want to know the square foot price of real estate in downtown Manhattan. They want to know... Um, yeah, the price of copper right now or uranium. How do I know the price of uranium? Or I want to be able to lend money on the blockchain using the true CPI. And then how do I do that? How can I integrate that? And so that was the other model that we've got. Um, so we've been betting big on the ladder, especially after BlackRock has announced that you know they want to see the tokenization of anything. Uh, Boston Consulting Group have come out with a big report in terms of how big this industry could potentially be, et cetera, et cetera. And so, yeah. Yeah, it's we amazing. Go yeah, what I, what a big a big value of this show is we really want the people listening to be able to uh, send like Stefan referrals, right? So what I'm trying to understand when I'm hearing you, Stefan, is the ICP, your ideal customer profile. So are you, are you selling Truflation as a service to financial institutions, investors? I mean, that's, that's kind of what I think I'm hearing, but, but tell the audience who is your ideal customer profile? 
What's the value directly to them? You talked about it a little bit, but just sum it up really quick so we understand who's that ICP and the value. Financial analysts and um, developers, that. right? My background's developers. We focus on developers and developers building financial products and financial instruments. Um, so those are the two types of engineers that we go after, software engineers and financial engineers. Nice, great. So- in terms of challenges, right? So you've been at Trueflation, I think I saw almost three years. So what have yeah. been some of your biggest challenges you faced, right? I think you've been at it probably longer in the duration, but what have been some of the biggest challenges that you faced and how did you overcome them? So, I mean, clearly the biggest challenge is, I mean, persistence, tenacity, it's hard, man. Everybody's questioning your business model. At the beginning, you don't know what the business model is. We just started. This is something, yeah, this is going to be big, right? Then I don't know how I'm going to make money off the back of this. You've right. got to motivate people. You've got to mobilize people. You've got to convince them to leave their jobs, to come into some dinky little startup, um, and some idea, uh, back of a napkin. How do you do that? Um, how do you mobilize uh, people, keep them motivated. Even in downtimes, you have no more money. You possibly can't pay salaries. You're waiting for an investor to come in. How do you keep people motivated and engaged at an early stage company? I mean, that's really hard. And then once you break through, how do you not get complacent? How do you constantly stay focused on the task that you've got? And I think there are lots of challenges along the way, right? Saying no is a really important one. The ability to say, no, I don't want to go down that path. I do not want to pursue this opportunity. This is where we're going to go. This is our North Star. That's how we get there. And everything on the side is just noise. Um, those are some of the things that are really um, important, I found. Uh, but the biggest one is definitely tenacity because everybody's going yeah. to say, say no. They don't believe in this model. Uh, they don't like what you're doing until all of a sudden you had a breakthrough and then, yeah, you, you, you just, people are beginning to lean in and, and, and finding those champions that lean in is, is another challenge, right? You're looking for needles in the haystack at the beginning before you become a bigger brand name that then people re rely on and they can know that, oh, nobody got fired because they bought IBM or nobody got fired because they used Apple. Um, so yeah, things like that. And, and until you reach that status, it is, it's definitely a, a long um, journey. So why, but, why Trueflation? So give me, give me, sum it up for me. And I want to give you some good content too, that you could use. Why Trueflation? So why should a financial analyst, or also you said a developer, why should they use Trueflation other than other places or other uh, constituents to get that data. So why? One is you get it all aggregated in 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 one one view. Number two, we're immutable, so we can't go back and change the data. Uh, number three, we have three price feeds per item that we track, so you know there's a level of accuracy in every item that we provide to you. And number four is we give it to you every single day, and so you immediately have a compounded benefit by using this data in real time. So I don't need to wait 30 days. I don't have, look at the what happened just this week, earlier this week on Monday, everybody saw the PME, you know, the, the uh, producers manufacturing capacity grow. Right. What does that mean? There's more products coming into the market. That means prices are likely to come down even further. That means the likelihood of interest rates coming down is less likely to happen. That means markets were anticipating a drop in interest rate, so more capital injection into the market. Bam! The market drops. But we had to wait 30, if not three months sometimes, for this data to come out. But if we got it every single day, we would know, okay, it's going to go down. It's increasing a little bit. We can balance off these jerks in the market. And, and that is something that we think gives a lot of people more advantages. I got to tell everybody listening. I mean, so far, so far I've done about uh, six of these with the new show format and Stefan is matching is the most passionate. So I, I could feel his passion 
It's like it's like when I'm talking to people about what we do, it's like, why would yeah. you do this with anyone else but me? Right. I mean, it's like, so if you're gonna be doing this this type of thing and need this type of data, I mean, definitely reach out to Stefan. I mean, I could tell he believes and has the passion in it. So last question here, Stefan, advice, right? So what are the two or three biggest pieces of advice that you would give other SaaS founders, other people listening to the show, say if somebody wants to start a company, what are the two biggest, I heard tenacity before, that was a big thing, but what are the two or three other things that that you've learned that you have to really focus on? Yeah, I mean, you're an entrepreneur, right? I mean, you, you're passionate about what you're doing. And, and I think you need the passion in order to keep that tenacity. And you need to have the belief all the time. When nobody else believes in you, you've really got to have the belief that you can do it. Um, I do think focusing on a market that not only you're passionate about, but that's big, that has big potential. But I think on the path to big, not to get distracted with too many different things. It's to stay narrow focused. And I think one great thing I really like is monopolize the niche, right? Just whatever it is, just monopolize, build your monopoly in one tiny niche. And if you beat that monopoly and you do the best job in that specific niche, I think you've got it made. It's that's all. And it's not to get distracted with all the noise on the left and on the right. And, oh, we'll go down this direction. No. Is that in your niche? Is that going to help you move that niche forward and become that monopoly player in that niche? That's that's something I, I would really recommend whatever industry you go after. I love it. I love it, Stefan. Thank you so much for being on the SAS poll show. And definitely if you are a financial analyst or an investor or a developer, go to Trueflation. Uh, actually, you said it was true.flation.com, right? So that was interesting. So go no, there. No, Truflation.com. So it's one I word, no E. A lot of people like the Lee E in there. So we just say trueflation.com. And yeah, that's that's our website. You can follow us on Twitter with the same Trueflation on Twitter. And, and and if you do use Telegram, that's where we also share a lot of our and build our community. Awesome. Awesome, Stefan. So world travels. Look, he, I, yep. I, where, are you, where are you again now, Stefan? You said you're in uh, you're in Hong Kong right now, I think, or you're. Yeah, I just was in uh, in London. We were at the Digital Asset Summit. There was a big event there around a lot of institutions in the UK moving into um, the blockchain, looking what to do, how to tokenize everything. And so we're an indexer, index, we've indexed a lot of the world pricing. So ultimately hoping to help them on their journey in trying to figure out how they can tokenize a lot of these assets. I'm in Hong Kong right now. I got into Hong Kong this week for a number, Web3 Summit is taking place here in Hong Kong. And then in Paris, there's the block, Paris Blockchain Week. And then in um, Dubai, there is Token 2049. So a number of different events. They come in seasons where all of a sudden, across a period of one to two months, there's big movement. Everybody's traveling, talking to each other. And we're all working 24-7 in order to keep connected, keep the teams connected. Uh, uh, and whilst you're traveling, give the feedback, share the opportunities that are available um, so that the business can still evolve and people can still build and, and develop, but lots of great opportunities. And um, yeah, that's, that's sort of how we, the awesome. industry sort of. So again, Stefan is at Trueflation and he is the most passionate guest I've had on so far. And he is the biggest world traveler. All right. So, so you, he's got number one for passion and number one for world travel. So thanks a lot, Stefan, for coming on the show. And I'm looking forward to following you more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. And keep up the good work. And thank you for being here. And um, yeah, look, reach out. I'm available and you can find me. Uh, Google's there. They have my name there. And so is LinkedIn. So yeah, thanks for having great, me. Great stuff. Thank you.